Uh, two years ago when I was uh, at that conference, I gave a talk about what we were doing with uh, cleaning up the CPU hot plug stuff. And that was really amazing things to hack on. And I so thought that I have seen every mess by now. What I didn't know at that point that the real big mess was lurking behind the corner. It was running already, but I wasn't told at that point, so I didn't know. Um, just let me go to a little bit of background first. So what we all know, and we all know how to deal with that, and the kernel has a history of doing the right thing here, is security bugs in the kernel. So the security bugs in the kernel affect the kernel. They do not affect random other things. Uh, so we have a security team, uh, security at kernel org, which handles the, which is the contact point, which handles these thingies. There's a list of, or a couple of security officers behind that mail address. It's not disclosed who is behind that, and it doesn't matter. Those people just take care of reports or contacts from researchers, random people, whatever. And we try to get, we try to bring in the people we need for a problem. If it's a bug in the networking code, we actually ask networking folks to look at it. And if it's in the block layer, we ask the block layer folks and not the other way around, which makes a lot of sense and is common sense. So the other thing, we aim for the disclosure of fixes as fast as possible. So we have a strict policy once the fix is available and ready and accepted or agreed on behind the closed doors. Um, we are going to publish it within seven days usually. Uh, if there's an exceptional reason not to do so, this is mostly coordinating with um, distro vendors or um, helping to prepare for larger rollouts and things like that, then we grant a, a 14 days uh, a period. That aligns with uh, what the distro security list is doing. So for a long, long time, we actually just dealt with that. We had the occasional hardware bug that some of you might be old enough to remember the F, oh well, F00F so zero zero bug, foof, uh, which was a bug. I mean, it was a hardware bug. We had to deal with it. It was nothing spectacular secret. So, but then two years ago, this guy came around. Um, and yeah, the question was, do we really have to deal with this? Yes, we did. So, and that raises the question, why is this so different? So hardware security bugs affect everyone. They affect Microsoft, they affect Apple, they affect VMware, every operating system on the planet. So disclosure process is because it's such a wide issue, the disclosure process is not as trivial as we would wish it to be. Uh, and the disclosure of the fixes, we can't just go and say, hey, we have a fix, let's ship it. No, we have to coordinate with all the other operating system vendors, with the hardware vendors. And in many of the cases we dealt with, we were depending on firmware updates, on microcode updates. Uh, which takes ages. Uh, so if Intel does a microcode fix for such a thing, or at least uh, provides some new uh, machine-specific spe machine register and functionality behind it, and they have to do it for a large number of CPU variants. So that takes months for them, at least a couple of weeks, for final testing and rollout verification and all these kinds of things until they are ready to ship it. 
So it's not only us who uh, can uh, say this is the pace where we are going and where we are going to ship it. So this takes month. So if you look at those, it, you can clearly see the different. It's a totally different story. But in 2017, uh, we hadn't even thought about that. No, nobody had. Neither we, nor the distro vendors, nor Intel, nor AMD, nor ARM, nor anybody else. It was just hitting us out of the blue. But 2017 was kind of special. Because nobody knew and had ever thought about it, there was no procedure in place how that should work. And of course, everything went wrong. So just let's look a little bit at the timeline and you'll see what went wrong. So in July, several researchers found out about spectrum meltdown. Um, actually, I was reading Anders Folk's blog. Anyone familiar with Anders Folk's blog? Cyberwtf.org. It's an interesting read. He's a really great uh, security researcher. And if you go there and look at an article uh, which is named Pandora's Box, um, basically he described Meltdown. But he said he couldn't find a way how to disclose information. He just could prove that there is a side channel. But at the same time, other research teams were looking into the same thing and found it independently of him. So there's several people were, were looking at that. Now, nice, but then the research teams went to Intel and said, hey, Intel, we, here is a problem. And Intel took over all coordination, and that's where the mess started. Um, in August, early August, Microsoft and Apple and a few others were disclosed. And I know out of a very trustable source that Intel told them, oh, don't worry about Linux, we take care of that. We come to that later. Um, in September, the two big distros and somebody else, I don't know, remember whom you, I couldn't figure it out uh, from, from my notes, uh, were disclosed. But interestingly enough, they were totally separated. They couldn't talk to each other. Intel had incident teams for each vendor. And guess what? The people of incident team A couldn't talk to incident team B, even if they were in the same office. So they had to talk to each other. Are you working on that <coughs> thing as well? Yeah, great. I mean, um, the outcome of this was horrible. Because when the whole thing went public, every vendor had differently broken patches in their vendor trees. And they all suffered at least a half a year to up to a year in order to get it fixed up. Not that I care, it's about dead kernels and things. And, but I mean, that's broken. So in October, I was obviously there were rumors. Um, and in October, at the kernel summit in Prague, uh, I got this closed, partially. Basically, what they told me, look at Anders Folk's blog. I said, OK, so somebody got it working. The reason, the only reason why they told me was because they were about to post the Kaiser patches. And of course, if I wouldn't have known the background, at least to some extent, I would have just said, go away. That was interesting. When the Kaiser patches were posted, a couple of days later, a friend of mine, a German tax journalist, sent me an email and said, what's wrong with you? Why didn't you go berserk? And why didn't Linus yell at them? 
I said, uh, well... <laughs> it kind of makes sense versus Kaisler and oh, we're not going to merge it tomorrow. So I had to uh, get him off my, uh, out of my mailbox again. So while we were working on cleaning up the Kaiser patches and slowly refactoring it into something usable, um, there was a blog post uh, on Twitter from Alex Ionescu in early November, 6th of November, if I remember co correctly. This guy is a security researcher, which uh, tends to disassemble uh, the Windows kernels. And he found uh, the kernel page table protection switching mechanism, the CR3 switch, in a better release of Windows on November 6th. Which is not surprising. They had three months to do that. Um, so in November, we were cleaning up that stuff. It was got renamed to PTI. I mean, we had way better acronyms for that. But it turned out, I can't even tell now. Um, but you can find it if you're interested. Um, so in end of November and early December, KPTI stuff was gradually merged into Linux 3 past or C1. So at that point, everyone with the same mind started to wonder that it, what's going on, because that's totally not how we do kernel development. Usually uh, rip out the guts of the entry codes, replace it, do page table management changes at a large scale in the middle of between RC1 and final, no. And Linus is silent. Mm -mm. <laughs> so, back in October, I only was told about Meltdown. Spectre wasn't even mentioned. Of course, I heard the rumors again. But three days before Christmas, Intel disclosed me about Spectre, and then they sent me a huge pile of patches. And I stared at it and said, no way. It's not going to happen. This was amazing. But I come to that in a minute. Um, so yes, it, this was a very unpleasant Christmas for me. Usually, I shut down my laptop uh, at least one or two days before Christmas and come back on January 6th. That's just what I've been doing for all of my professional life. Um, in this year, it was slightly different. I shut down the laptop on Christmas, on December 24, uh, at 2 AM in the morning, and restarted it on December 25th at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. My family was really amused. So was I. OK, we knew what was on stake, and we had to get that shit out and sorted. And we had bugs out there. We had problems out there in, in, in testing. And so we had to fix that. So on January 3rd, the whole thing went public uh, five days before the embargo ended, because uh, inadvertently, somebody posted a patch with a too explicit change log. It's all my fault, because I'm always asking for very detailed, very good explanatory change logs. In that particular case, it was not really helpful. Uh, it was unintentional. I was talking to Tom Lendachki from, from AMD about that at a conference over a beer, and he said, at the moment where he had sent, he knew that it was not the right thing to do. But the problem with email, you can't call it back. So once this went into the public space, uh, we observed something which I call panic engineering. 
So remember, there were different teams at Intel working on this separately. So we got three patch sets addressing Spectre. Okay, none of them, none of those patch sets made sense. Then the distro people came in and said, "Oh, and we have extra switches and runtime and boot time and SysFS and whatever thing is on top of that, and we have performance optimizations of all sorts and whatever." And everybody wanted to have his variant uh, merged somehow, but we had didn't even have documentation. We didn't even know what we should address. So we, I started to ask questions on the mailing list. This was totally nuts. There were discussions going on, people claiming A, people claiming B. If you ask three people at Intel, you got five opinions from those three people because they were contradicting each, each other on various uh, uh, mail threads. So I really was not able to figure out what the hell is going on. So, and the quality of patches was really amazing. There was one which claimed, yeah, we have this new MSR we need to do in the entry code, and here is the macro for writing it. And it w the macro was actually sprinkled all over the entry code, and it was fully tested and whatever. Oh, it writes the number of the MSR into ECX, moves the lower 32-bit into EDX, rather the upper 32-bit in the EDX and the lower into EAX and then ends the macro. Uh, where is the right MSR? I couldn't find it. It wasn't there, but it was fully tested. And that was my comment on that. I still think that is true. So, at some point, I got tired of it, and I wrote this mail. So here is the simple list of questions, all to be answered with yes and no. And I was not accepting any other answer than yes and no, because we already spent the week with, oh, maybe it could and would and bad for performance and whatever. We all knew it would be slow, no matter what. But we didn't even know what we were doing and what a freaking MSR write was actually causing. Was it permanent? Was it to be targeted? Whatever. We had no documentation. Great. So I had to go. I felt like I'm hurting a kindergarten. Uh, I mean, if you have to come up with a list of questions and say, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Afterwards, I collected the, of course, different answers to that <laughs> question list tried to make sense out of it, came up with a new set of questions. I said, again, yes and no. So this went on for a couple of days. It was crazy. So about 10 days after it, uh, we had at least a minimal subset of things in. We had, uh, the, um, for uh, Spectre, we won the array uh, bounds uh, fixes in. And Spectre V2, we had some basic things covered, but not, not all of it, because we didn't have documentation and all of that. So that's where I just said, stop it. We have to go back to normal. We have to put the heads back on the chickens, because that's how it was feeling like a huge amount of headless chickens running around in circles. Guess how? effective technical uh, outcome is when that happens. Um, actually, it calmed down after that. We went into a, into a quiet phase and then restarted looking at the things with a fresh mind and actually got the, the Spectre V2 fixes and the, the, the MSR documents. We got papers. Uh, we got actual documentation so we could actually understand what we were doing. And it took some time, but all of this could have been avoided if some company had talked to us at in August. I mean, we would have had 
six months to, to silently do the Kaiser thing, it would have been in the normal development cycle. Most of the Kaiser stuff would have been upstream already before or C1 was cut. Uh, and we could, would have had time actually to do sensible like technical discussions on Spectre V1 and Spectre V2. So it was totally screwed. Intel actually acknowledged that it was screwed and um, there was something happening right after uh, the, the total mess subsided. Uh, so we got an agreement between the community and uh, distro vendors. So we wanted to have industry-wide collaboration, no compartmentation. That means people can work together as usual. And we wanted full information disclosure from the, disclosure from the very beginning and not that, oh, I give you this piece now and another piece next week and maybe when it's too late the other missing three pieces no that doesn't work so and the distro vendors agreed we want to have upstream first we want to have reliable show ones where we can backport it and so everybody ends up with the same set of mitigations with the same set of switches, with the same set of SysFS in the files and all these kind of things in their distro kernels, which makes a lot of sense because that's what we are normally doing as well, except for what the distro is doing aside. I don't care. So that brought, that's okay, Intel agreed on it. It kind of worked out, I come to that in a bit. Uh, but then we ran into another problem, how to do communication. Mm. LKML is not the right place to do that, obviously. So somebody smart came up with Keybase I.O. Said, oh, this is great. This is a cryptographic uh, secure chat environment. It's great. I said, yeah, and how do you do patch review on a chat? It's, it's like WhatsApp, just different. Um, I'm still not on it, but I know Greg Hortman is monitoring it, and it's kind of, uh, he says, uh, because Greg is in Europe, so and most of the people on that, on the chat channel or in the US, so when we go, when we stop working, they wake up, and then when we come back and look at the, he looks at the backlog, he has to scroll up through 10 pages of cat pictures, food pictures, uh, where are we meeting for drinks tonight, and all these kind of things to find something like five sentences of technical content. So very useful. Now, we said, no, it can't work. You can't do patch review on a chat. That doesn't, doesn't work. Maintain CC lists and PGP encrypt everything to everyone and no, maintaining CC lists never works. And then we have Linus. Uh, he's not the only one who hates PGP for a reason, uh, but he hates it more than others do. So PGP was not even on the plate to discuss. So I said, like, okay, let's look at encrypted mailing lists. I went out and looked for projects. There are only a few. There are mailman patches which are outdated and not longer maintained, years old, totally broken. Um, there is another project which got abandoned uh, five or six years ago. And there are two active projects. One is a, is a big corporate S-MIME thingy. Uh, which lacks uh, PGP support, and the other one is PGP only, and it's looked actively maintained. And I thought, yeah, let's give that a try. Even if Linus complains, maybe I can hack something up to make it work for him. So I went and started reading the documentation, and it says, install the package on your mail server. I said, what? 
This is having the private key of the list and I install it on my public mail server? Mm, maybe those people do not understand security very well. <laughs> so I go, went through a couple of loops and hoops, got it running in a VM by some definition of running, got it configured, and then we started to just send test mails to it. Every third mail broke it. And then I was looking into the code. I, I said, it can't be that hard to fix. It's a huge pile of Ruby code. And it's everything intertwined. Web GUI, daemons, database, and some various cryptos, crypto code, and mailing list handling code. And it's all totally impenetrable. It's, there was no way to do that. So what now? Yeah, uh, Python to the rescue. As I'm dealing with email every day, I have a huge amount of e uh, scripts which already deal with the inner workings of emails in order to extract content and, and, and look at uh, things and get patches out of them and things like that. So I'm familiar with how email I internally works. Um, and then I said, I don't want anything fancy. I want something where I throw an encrypted mail in and get a differently encrypted mail out. At that time, I was asking Linus, what kind of mail client would you use except your Gmail setup? And he said, Alpine, nothing else. And as I'm an Alpine user myself, I know that GPG integration into Alpine is a pain. It's just not usable. You can't, can't do it. So, but I know uh, from another occasion that uh, SMIME integration into Alpine is perfectly fine. So I said, OK, let's do SMIME and uh, PGP on both ends. I just used a simple YAML text file for configuration, which is not much of a configuration. It's mostly the subscriber lists and, and, and things like that. Then I wanted to do it in Python 3, because Python 2 sucks when, uh, when you look at email handling and message handling. Uh, but at that point, the M2 crypto uh, library Python M2 crypto, which I needed for SMIME, was not yet ported to Python 3. I was, there was not even something you could try out. They were still debating. Um, so I had to do it in Python 2, which sucks even more. But three days later, I had it up and running. So the first version. Um, so after fixing a couple of bugs, we broke the first corporate mail server. What happened? Somebody sent a patch set to the list with 10 patches, something like 25 subscribers, eight working for one particular corporate. So 80 mails encrypted to the recipients went into that corporate mail server. The corporate spam filter tried to figure out what the hell is this mail went on for quite a time to figure out what is this mail. The backlog on incoming was getting worse over time. And at some point, the mail server went out of memory, crashed. <laughs> so they restarted the whole thing. It started again, looking at those encrypted mails, trying to figure out whether there's spam in it. And nothing happened. The mail server crashed again. So at some point, they decided to whitelist us. And yeah, we, we broke more of them. So uh, some other company got a new spam appliance, brand new spam appliance from Cisco. So the result was that out of five people subscribed on the list, everyone missed particular mails, but not the same ones. So if you send out a patch set with five patches, person A got one, three, five, person two got two, three, four, five, and so on. So it was totally random, and they weren't able to train that thing. So they, we got whitelisted there as well. So that seems like a, a, a recurring picture. So 
when we started using it more and more, new people came in onto the list and brought in other male clients. So it started with Thunderbird, which has a RFC compliant version, but the old one, which is deprecated for GPG. Then somebody else came in and used Thunderbird on Windows, which is differently broken. I actually asked the guy, can you install the same version from, fresh from, the, from the, 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 the Mozilla packages, the Thunderbird packages on a Linux and on a Windows machine? So same code base version, different mail formats. Yeah, OK. Uh, and it got worse when somebody discovered there is a GPG plugin for Outlook. <laughs> this violates every rule on the planet. <laughs> but I got it sorted. And then the first version was, of course, one big Python script. Then I switched it from pipe to mail there because there was a, 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 some problems to solve with that. A couple of weeks ago, I actually converted it to Python 3. And 18 months after 18 months in use and 3,500 incoming mails handled uh, the sources up there on kernel work. So if you want to play with it, it has documentation. And the documentation says, don't use it on the public mail server. So here is the, the picture how that works. So you have the public mail server. You have the firewall. You have somewhere a poison cabinet where you put that thing away, and you have that secured list server. And of course, that guy has the public keys. Configuration is still YAML-based. Uh, I just keep it in Git. Uh, I want to just add a new subscriber or add a new somebody's key expired. Uh, I just uh, fix the public key ring on my laptop, push it into a Git repository, and that machine will just pick it up from there. So the Git repository is obviously not hosted on GitHub. Um, a mail is retrieved, just I use get mail for it. it. You can use fetch mail or whatever, it doesn't matter. So that was a side project because I have nothing else to do. So we were using that for SSPD, uh, L1TF, MDS, and we were working together upstream first, got us to the point where everybody had the same thing, where everybody was talking about the same, same thing, and everybody was testing the same thing. So it's kind of business as usual, but there's still a problem. Because uh, if we wanted to have somebody in the group on the list we had to dis make sure he's properly disclosed. And because Intel was still ruling the game, that was really painful. It took me six months to bring people in. Six months discussing with lawyers, with managers, with lawyers, with managers. And the, the, the most complicated people are obviously lawyers. The universal tool for them is NDA. Yeah, do they have an NDA? No. Can I sign an NDA? No. No, the current community at itself cannot sign an NDA. And somebody who is working for a non-disclosed entity cannot sign an NDA privately either. So what now? Uh, here's a solution Shakespeare <laughs> suggested, but we can't use it. So uh, last year at the Maintainer Summit, in, we sat together and discussed that. And uh, we agreed on that we need a formal process, and we need something which acts as a substitute for NDAs, and which something which makes lawyers feel good. Um, Greg uh, and Shiri Kushina and myself got volunteered to do that. So we came up with a formal process for it. We get a separate point of contact. It's solely for hardware security issues. We are going to reject any other thing. Uh, it's only for this kind of, of, of trouble. 
uh, it's a published list of security officers. We had to do that, and it's uh, very unsurprisingly Linus, Greg, and myself, because we are all uh, listed as Linux Foundation fellows and considered by that title uh, being independent, vendor, independent, whatever, neutral persons, holy or whatever. I don't care. Um, and we use encrypted mailing lists for that. Contrary to the security kernel org mailing uh, uh, contact, it's not encrypted. We do not have uh, a key published for that. So we, need, we have set up strict disclosure rules for our kernel developers, for domain experts. And we have to be aware that there is a potential conflict of interest. So just to illustrate it, we have something Intel or anybody else brings to us and said, here we have that hardware problem and we need somebody who is actually working for a different hardware vendor. But he's an expert in that field and he's our best man. So how, how, how do we get it, him, him, him in? So there's a conflict of interest because the disclosing party doesn't want to disclose it to the other vendor for whatever reasons. We can't solve that problem. That's not the scope of this but we have to make sure that we can bring that person in. So the, one of the things, and that's the NDA substitution, I come to that in a minute, is we created a memorandum of understanding where all the people wh whom we bring in have to adhere to, they have to pledge that, they do that. How it works uh, in a minute. And of course it's, the whole thing covers how the embargo and disclosure coordination across the industry works. So here's the memorandum of understanding. It's way too long to read. Uh, but the important part is there, that the involved developers which get dragged into an incident um, pledge to adhere that to the rules we have, to the embargo rules, and keep the received information confident. That's what the lawyers care about, that things do not trickle out early. So we have no formal tool to go after people if they violate that. So the only thing we can do is we can immediately exclude them, and in, as a consequence, they will lose trust. And losing your trust in the kernel community is basically um, not what you want if you want to keep your job. Because that might and will affect your normal work, uh, your daily workflow or your daily work outside the scope of such issues as well. Because uh, if you spill the beans, I'm not going to talk to you anymore, uh, really. Um, but so this is what we can do. This is what we, what we wrote up, and we distributed that to, uh, in February to quite a lot of big corporates, and we got a, a decent feedback. Some of them did not, but uh, by now, most of the big corporates actually who are, might be affected of this or who are involved in this. Uh, gave us feedback, the lawyers are happy, they adhere to the rules, and they think we are doing a, a good thing here. So just a little bit of workflow. See, we get an initial report to the hardware security team. We check it for it being valid. If not, we just send a private reply and say, go away. Send it to kernel security org, um, and uh, it's just a bug. We, we don't deal with that. Software bug. Then we set up an initial mailing list, start discussion with the disclosing party, and figure out whom do we need there. And then we form an initial team of a couple of people who then actually works on the problem. Um, we set up a mailing list for them and hand off. The disclosing party uh, discloses it to the response team. There is initial discussion, working on patches. They bring that more people in. At some point, the embargo obviously ends and the patches go public. And 
they can add experts. And if something, what I mentioned before, this conflict of interest happens, then probably uh, the initial hardware security team will come in and, and, and help to resolve that conflict and sort out. But we have timelines for that. It's very tight, so we don't want to wait six months again. That's just not working. Um, so all major, major players agreed. We have um, also in the document, it's up on, uh, in the kernel documentation, we have, uh, in, uh, we have established process ambassadors in, in the companies, in the, uh, at the vendors, um, at some of the open source distros. So that's basically a point of contact where if things go wrong, if a corporate tries to circumvent our process, we can talk to them and they, they sort that out internally. So that was... Uh, it's pretty good, but, and that's my hope. Hopefully we won't that to, to have to use that ever again. <laughs> Wishful thinking. At least not before I'm retired. That's what I said in a discussion recently. Um, I fear that's a wish, but one can dream. With that, I'm open for questions. Uh, wait a moment. Uh, so uh, during uh, meltdown, um, that the meltdown did affect not only Intel, but also uh, AMD and a couple IRM uh, folks. When did those um, contributors from AMD and, and IAM got brought in um, to the discussion? That's I'd, the first question. I don't know when, uh, when AMD was disclosed. I have no idea. But uh, I mean, the, the, there the, the problem was not that big because AMD could follow the Kaiser patches on the mailing list so they, they could figure out what. And okay. they, they, they knew about it. For sure, ARM was disclosed as well, but later on, I think. But I have no detailed information about that. So the, the, the problem is we can't influence, the much we wish, we can influence what the corporates are doing between each other. I mean, that's a mess they have to sort out. My second question would be, uh, when you formed the security team uh, on the new process, could you brought in, uh, if, if that was from a uh, report from Intel, could you brought in people from AMD by your own or? Weak, weak. So, so two, two things, dear. If AMD is already disclosed, then it's a no-brainer. If not, then we tell Intel we are going to bring in somebody because we need to ask him a question. Because X8, I, mean, I told Intel that very clear uh, during the last one. Um, ac the x86 code in the kernel is not owned by Intel. And it's not Intel specific, it runs on all vendors. And if we change the semantics in the entry code, which affects everyone, then we want to ask those people a question. And they have to grant us that. And not after the fact. Yeah. So that's how we set up the process that we can basically enforced to bring in one particular person, which then pledges to adhere to, the, to our rules and not spill the beans inside of, of, of the other vendor. So it's just to have his opinion on a particular piece of thing. So that's the way how we set it up, or try to set it up. And industry kind of agreed that this is uh, um, at least a workable way for them. Um, is, my un <coughs> is my understanding correct that this good communication thingy you set up is mainly w within the Linux world? Uh, or is this also uh, other communication channels to the developers of other operating systems? So, so actually we have a couple of other people on the list. So we have, the, the, there's a, one, of, one FreeBSD developer is on the list and 
Does somebody, somebody from Microsoft who's not directly uh, involved in the Windows side, but who is uh, working for their Linux team and he's basically communicating with the Linux, with the Windows people. So in, in, in theory, the, uh, everybody who is on the, on the wider disclosure list, so we also get for, got from Intel a disclosure list, which entities are disclosed. So, which corporates are disclosed, so we can talk to them. And we actually have communication channels, even with Microsoft kernel developers, we have communication channels with Apple people. Cool. Uh, VMware. So, there's a, a cut. VMware wouldn't subscribe to that list because they are not allowed to look at the kernel source for whatever reasons, I don't care. Um, so, but we have open open communication channels by now and this is established that the contact rule we get which is the list of disclosed parties is open to use so we have to actually to go contact the security person at microsoft and say hey can we talk to your kernel people because you have the same problem uh, and we would like to to discuss a detail of how to handle that with you because you might have a po different point of view that happened uh, during the, the the last couple of uh, incidents that we actually had either phone conversations or email conversations with various people or we had a face to face meeting last December where every everybody was in the room sounds good Given that the initial meltdown inspector issues were not found by Intel, they were found by independent security researchers, uh, what would your advice be to an independent security researcher who thinks they found something new? Like what should they, you know, what should their first few steps be? I mean, they should not, they should not give control out of their hand. So the, 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 the obvious problem there is if you go to the first hardware vendor, they will try to grab control because they, they want to have it as secret as possible. So instead of that, if the security researchers keep control and say, OK, we are defining who is going to be disclosed in the first place, and then Intel can still disclose other third parties if they need to. But if the security researcher would go and say, OK, I talked to Intel, I talk to AMD, I talk to ARM because they might be affected. I haven't tested it, but it's obvious because they are speculating all the same way. So it's not a surprise that uh, whether they have it or not. Um, and then go out to OS people and talk to them. Then the whole control freak mess doesn't happen because nobody has direct control. Still, we have we need to have some coordination across the industry to actually figure out who is doing what and when, mm -hmm. because we have to agree on the embargo dates depending on who is ready when. And of course, it's not only dependent on, on the OS vendors. As I said, it's microcode and other things. It's, it's an unholy mess. Whether there's a good solution to it, I don't know. OK, thanks. Was it, uh, oh, it on? Okay. Was it actually, do you think some hardware vendors were maliciously trying to make this process more difficult or just because they didn't know how to deal with this issue? Um, that's a tough question. <laughs> I'd say I'd err out on the site they didn't know. Maybe there was some human uh, factors involved which would uh, allow to argue for the other thing, but I don't want to go there. Okay. I learned diplomacy, uh, diplomacy in the last two years. Yeah, and I, I was, it was just interesting from the perspective of the developers that actually have to fix it and whether they were like, strongly affected by, by company politics. I mean, the NDA, NDAs were obvious. But yeah, I mean, that's something I told a certain company. You're created problems which we didn't cause 
we have to fix them and you're pre actively preventing, uh, preventing us from fixing them. So this doesn't make sense. And that's why we started to, to think about our procedures and say, hey, no, we have to, to actually have something which we can whack over the heads and say, no. Um, whether that's going to make things better, I don't know. Uh, I don't want to try it out. Hopefully never, ever again. In fact, yeah. Uh, yeah. You're saying about what I uh, was about to say. In fact, the difference between software bugs and hardware bugs is that hard in case of hardware bugs, the vendor is having a problem and tries to make uh, all software vendors think they have a problem. Of and course. And if they are uh, using such complicated process, it is, as you said, because they want to keep control of communication because they fear the loss of communication. And uh, it's actually much easier to simply refuse stupid communication because ultimately, when the embargo ends, they will be the one in trouble uh, if the issue is not fixed. If uh, uh, the the no, 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 I, I disagree here because um, let's let me take out the, one of the most dangerous ones. Let me take out out L one TF. So I mean. A certain company still has a white paper on their uh, on their uh, troubleshooting page where they claim, "Oh yeah, and no attacks have been seen in the wild." Fact is, and I talked to uh, both Google and Amazon about that at Plumbers a couple of weeks ago. You cannot even detect the attack. So all you're seeing is a CPU consuming 100% CPU time, which is, I mean, they are hosting guests. How many guests consume 100% CPU time? A lot, because people run insane, work, insane workloads in the cloud. So you cannot even tell what that thing is doing. And if it's, so depending on what, you're, what attack vector you're using, you, you're not even seeing page faults. If TSX is enabled in the machine uh, and it's enabled in ac uh, accessible in the guest, which it is, if it's generally available, then you can hide L1TF, speed it up by a factor, factor of 15 and make it re more reliable by a factor of 4. So and just to, to give you uh, a sense, you can't, with L1TF on an average server, x86 uh, Intel server, you can do uh, brute force physical memory scan with a bandwidth of roughly one gigabit, gigabit per second, just to give you perspective. So if we would say, no, if you can't communicate proper, we just ignore you, we expose a lot of people to risk. And the problem is the big, the big uh, uh, distro people, they will just merge every crap Intel throws over the fence just to have it. Uh, that happened. We have seen that the outcome is not pretty. They regret, regretted it afterwards. And, but there's a totally other aspect. There's a huge number of companies out there who do not run that stuff. They run Debian kernels. They run uh, uh, standard uh, community distro kernels. And that's a huge number of, of, of smaller companies. So you put those people massively on risk. And that's why I, I not went there. I mean, that's why I spent two years of fighting uh, Taylor new, uh, new tooth and nail uh, with Intel about uh, uh, a, proper, a proper handling of those things. I see your point. but. Uh I see your point, but I still disagree because uh, you don't see this, in my opinion, from a vendor's perspective. Oh, it's not mine. Uh, you don't see it from a vendor's perspective. For the vendor, it is a big problem to imagine that all of these ones will not be fixed because it will cast a very bad image on their brand and it's a big problem to fix afterwards. 
So uh, they, they, you they, wish. They, they will try to, to blame uh, all those who did not upgrade or whoever. But in the end, uh, they know that the, uh, the details, the history can be made public as you did. And when you see that they start uh, with uh, uh, forcing you to use uh, inappropriate, unsuitable communication tools or stupid processes or whatever, I mean, th they are the ones who will lose the most. So they, they will have to fix that process no, earlier. Their, their, their marketing machine is way better than ours. Believe me. I mean, uh, right now, so the, the, the only thing which got reasonable traction was Meltdown Spectre. Mm -hmm. It was covered in the press. Also, the, the whole mess around it was covered. OK. L1TF, yeah, it got mentioned. The rest, business as usual. Nobody cares. And so, the, and the other problem is that all of the other OSs will go with whatever Intel or whoever is in control will do with them because they have these established channels. So it's we who are out of the loop, and I don't want to inflict that the problems. Intel is or any other big corporate. I bet none of the others would have acted differently. Uh, it just happens that it's pretty concentrated over there. Um, uh, they, they, they wouldn't have acted differently. So we would have, that's the balance we have to take. Is, is our, response, our personal responsibility against our non-big kernel, uh, big enterprise distro users, and there's a lot of them, and I I wouldn't have taken the responsibility to let them down. No, that I mean, that's contrary to my uh, uh, common belief. So. Okay. Yeah. So, very last question. Oh, it's not a question. It's just like, like you also suffer a lot of discredit if you didn't patch that. Like if, like they were using distro kernels, they didn't face that problem. And then they were using the mainline kernel, and they faced that problem. You know, they would blame that mainline kernel wouldn't wasn't good enough. Yeah, okay, so of that's course. That's just a simple. I mean, I project. could live with that blame. So that I I can live with a lot of blame. I don't care. Uh, but uh, no, I would not. It would not have been possible for me to say I let the users down. What Intel talks about me, I don't care, or any other big corporate. I mean, a lot of them hate me anyway. So. With that, thank you for your attention.